feeling extremely settled this morning. Um, I feel really great. And today, um, can somebody say vulnerable? I don't have a PowerPoint. I don't have a presentation uh, because sometimes that can be cute and people can get lost with what they see on the screen. Um, And they can just look for like one quote so they can steal it and put it on Instagram like I didn't say it and then they get two likes. Anyway, but um, so what I'm going to do today is I just have my iPad. Say iPad. iPad. Say iPad anointing. So it's just going to be us this morning. Is that all right? So the thing that, uh, so we're in this series, uh, well, no, it's the month of what? Honor. honor. And the past couple of weeks, we've learned how to honor our time. We've learned how to honor people. We've learned how to honor so many different aspects of life that are extremely important. But today what we're going to talk about is honoring the vision. Now, it's we, the, <laughs> you're good, thank you. The church this, uh, today is in a really weird place where um, people can explain how they feel. Somebody can tell you, I need to take care of me, and it feels like they're attacking you. I just need to take care of myself and my family. And it's just like, oh, okay. Like, that, like you taking care of what you have to take care of shouldn't prove a deficiency in me. And the fact that you need to take care of something doesn't mean I did something. It means that you neglected something that was important. So don't get upset with me because you need to take care of house and home because you weren't. You can't. And if we're breaking bread together, if what God showed you is what God showed me, then taking care of your family is just a part of the process. Say in stride. There are some things that you're going to have to start taking in stride, and I'm going to have to start taking in stride. So let me go back. Say vulnerable. I'm just going to be vulnerable with you today. The Bible is basically a whole bunch of stories that are applicable today. God is the same then, now, and forevermore, right? God never was. He never will be. He just is, right? Trying to explain where God came from is like trying to explain your love for your wife or your children. Daddy, how much do you love me? I just love you. And kids are like, well, do you love me this big? And it's like, I don't, if I had 10,000 arms that could wrap around the infinity of the universe, it, it, it still wouldn't be enough. This morning, all I want to do, hopefully, through the grace of God, is, is that I just, I just want to help encourage you to, 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 to grab on to what God showed you in the beginning. It's so simple, and it's, it's, it's so easy as a concept, but, but it, the simple things are the hardest things to do. The simple things are the hardest things to do. If I put you up on top of a cliff and I told you to jump, it's only four letters. What? J, U, very simple. But what goes through your mind when you're standing at the edge? The act might be simple, but the process and the method might be hell. A lot of times what God shows you in your forefront seems simple. God shows you the glitz and the glamour. He shows you the gold. He shows you your kids out of poverty. He shows your son not addicted to pornography anymore, all your children serving God. But what God shows you in the end, he, there's like this gray area in the middle. That's what we call vision. People think that vision is the end goal. No, vision is the mud and the dirt you have to go through to get to what God showed you. So we praise, we praise God. God, thank you so much for showing me. God, thank you so much that you showed me that I've, I'm, I'm, I've beaten cancer. But then you don't pray in between that time. God, thank you so much that, that you've healed my family, that you've given me financial breakthrough, but you don't save. God, thank you so much that I see at the end I, I beat this addiction, but you never give your husband or your wife your phone password. So God is looking for us to do what? Honor the vision and honor the process to get there. A lot of people want to get to the point where you are. A lot of people want to get to this point where they think everybody has made it. But the minute they give you the one, two, threes, and the ABCs to get there, nobody wants it. So God can give the children's of, children of Israel, uh, of, of Israel, right, like these like God's chosen people. He can tell them, I'm going to take you to a land of milk and honey, and they never see it. Which basically means that what God shows you is not as important as the journey you're going to have to take to get there. This is not a message to make you feel good. As I say every single time, I don't need any more friends. This church is not to make you feel good. So if you leave out of here frustrated, I've done my job. If you leave out of here looking at your life and you're disgusted with it, I've done my job. If you leave out of this place and you're contemplating coming back, I've done my job. Because everybody wants everything to be smoothed over like cake icing. I'm not interested in icing. I want the cake. 
A lot of our lot, man, this is good. I know it is because y'all being quiet. Anyway, so a lot of us, we have a tiny cupcake, which is everything that we are, and there's a whole bunch of icing. I was a kid, whenever I would eat a cupcake, we used to call icing foo-foo. Bring me a cake with icing, nah, give me the cake. Clear the icing, give me the cake. Clear the icing, give me the cake. I'm going to keep, y'all, y'all, y'all feel me? Clear the icing, give me the cake. I don't, I don't want, I don't care how cute it looks, because icing can't sustain how hungry I am. <laughs> give, give me the Give me the cake with the eggs and the batter and the flour and the vanilla and the sugar. That's what I want because I can eat one cupcake and be straight, but I'm going to have to eat how much icing am I going to – then I'm going to get a sugar high, then I'm going to crash and get a headache. So just give me the substance of my life. When I'm watching the news, I don't care about what happened. How did it end? Your marriage might be in troubles and shambles right now in this room. That's icing, but what's the cake? What, how does it look at the end? I know a lot of y'all are super saved and y'all need the word, but we're going to talk about this today. Is that cool? How frustrated would you be if you, found a, if you found a giant cake, you cut it in half, and there was a cupcake in the middle of a whole bunch of icing? Mm? Yeah, that's how I feel. How would you feel? You feel cheated. You feel frustrated. And that's what the word of God has become. That's, that's what p- preachers are teaching that God loves and that he saves and that he died on the cross and all that other stuff. That's icing. Uh-oh. He died on the cross and he bled and died and he was stabbed and pierced. Yeah, that's great. But what's the cake? Why? What's the substance of why he died? God died so that he could give you power, dominion, and a vision to work towards. Now, I'm not saying that the blood of Jesus and him dying on the cross wasn't important, because that's extremely important. But him dying on the cross is not the end. It's a doorway. That's why we don't worship the cross. I, like, you will never see me wear a cross on my, like, on, on, my, on my chest, because the cross is, we worship the cross more than we worship the God that died on it. We worship the blood more than the God that, 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 that bled it. We worship the woman that gave birth to God as if her miraculously getting pregnant is more important than him saving the world. So I'm not interested in the icing. I just want the cake. Come on, do it. Get, I don't want the icing. Do it. Come on. I, like, I don't, like, get, get that out of here. I want the cake. At Thanksgiving, I don't want no sides. Where the turkey at? You go to people's house. Oh, we have some cranberries. No. Where's the turkey at? If I don't see a turkey in 10 minutes, I'm leaving up out of here. But a lot of us are sufficing to see the frosting in other people's lives, and we're eating it. If you eat foo-foo enough, you're going to have to keep eating it because it's not a filler. Okay, all right, well, good morning. Welcome to Ambassadors Worship Center. I'm going to give you a couple of points, and then we're going to get out of here, I guess. Are we good? Are you happy to be in the house of God this morning? Eat the cake. Anna, make, eat the cake. All right. Here it is. So the title that my mother wonderfully gave me is Understanding Our Vision and Our Mission. But y'all know that I'm kind of out there, so I have another title. I love you. (laughs) This is my title. It's, It's Where Is Your Confidence? You show me where your confidence is, and I can, you, you, you can tell somebody's life. Look at your neighbor next to you and say, do you trust me? No, ask him for real. Like, do you really trust me? I feel like God is literally calling us out, and God is asking us, hey, do you trust me? Do, like, do, like, do you really trust me? With what I showed you a while ago, I know it was 10 years ago, but do you still trust that what I showed you then is still relevant now? Are, 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 you, are, are you okay with me digging into that this morning? Okay. Let's talk. So, man, this is so good. So being vulnerable, I'm just going to share with you what God has been sharing with me. And it might seem a little bit weird and a little bit wonky, but I, I'm dyslexic. My brain moves at like a mile a minute. I'm talking as slow as I possibly can right now for the older generation to be like, what, what do you say? I'm, I'm working on it. You're welcome. Um, but... Can I just give it to you how God gave it to me? Is that all right? 
Okay. You might need a fifth of chocolate milk after you leave from here. Here we go. So when we look at Exodus, when we look at the children of Israel, there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens before they get to the wilderness. There's a whole bunch of things that have to happen before they're even set free by Pharaoh, right? You have the plagues. You, well, before that, you have to have Moses be born. Then you have to have Moses, you know, sent down the river, right? And then all the people, all of the, they, they put the blood over the doorway and the death angel passes over it, right? And then he, uh, he, he ends up at the palace of Pharaoh, right? And he, he raises him in the Egyptian way and teaches him how to count, teaches him how to be a priest and whatnot. Then what happens? Then he really realizes who he is, right? And he sees a guard whipping a Hebrew, right? An Israelite, right? And then what does he do? He like Spartacus that dude off the, off the pyramid, right? Dude dies. He gets scared and he runs where? Into the wilderness, Sometimes the thing that God sent you to is so scary because God doesn't need you to see him. He just wants to see how you work when you don't see him. You ever watched your kids play when they can't see you? What are you hoping? You're hoping that they get something that you probably dropped on them a couple days ago. So sometimes when God is not around, you're like, oh, where are you at? God says, I'm just watching you. Stop looking for me and deal with what's in front of you. Square peg, round hole. Square peg, round hole. And you're watching them, like, just put, it's right there, just right there. And then they call and they scream. But if you do it, they've learned nothing. we got to stop asking God to fix stuff that he put in front of us to fix. And then when we don't fix it, get mad at God like he wasn't there. No. Mm. If I hire you for a job and I give you a job and you don't do the job, you can't be mad at me when I fire you. And if you are, you're crazy. So Moses gets there. He, then he, he runs. He runs back. And he tries to figure out, like, how can I save these folks? Runs back out, right? And then he, he finds a camp. He finds a beautiful woman. This is like the spark notes of the Bible. So read the story if you'd like. Finds this woman. And then while he's out there in the wilderness, he, he's at a burning bush. And God is like, look, I want you to go save everybody that you left. And Moses is like, <laughs> time out. <laughs> what? He says, you want me to go back to the place of my turmoil? And you want me to go back to the place that you delivered me from? So many of us believe that once we're delivered from something, that we should never go back to it. But sometimes when you go through something and it's hell and you get out, you have a, like a specific something to free the people that are still in it. No other prophet could have went back to Egypt and freed the Israelites because they didn't go through the stuff that Moses went through. Their icing wouldn't have iced the cake that God asked Moses to ice. Come on, man. Like, y'all get that? Did you, did you get that, Mad? Okay, just want to make sure somebody got it. So up until this point, he's been ordered to kill. He's saved by his mother, murdered a soldier, defended a slave, realized he was a slave, denied Pharaoh, ran away, found a daddy out in the wilderness, got booed up, booed up, booed up, and he nearly kills his brother. Let me give you the definition of confidence. Write this down. There's no PowerPoint, so we're going to be good students today. Amen? This is the definition of confidence. It's the feeling or belief that one can, re one can rely on someone or something. Firm trust. It's the state of feeling certain about the truth of something. A feeling of self-assurance arising from one's appreciation of one's own abilities or qualities. The root of confidence starts with your abilities. It's not the other. A lot of us, we put our confidence in things. We put our confidence in people. We even put all of our confidence in God in this sense of thinking that, oh, you're going to make it happen. But God has created us as change agents. Amen? The point of the cross wasn't just to die so that we can go to heaven. Because once you go to heaven, it's like game over. You have no power in heaven. All you're going to do is worship God. So I'd rather live 120 years here on earth and just destroy some stuff here and then go. Like, I'm going to be begging. I'm going to be on my sick bed like, no, God, wait. Just don't, no, no. Like, I'm going to be fighting. Like, I'm, I'm not ready to go because, like, I'm not done playing here. <laughs> the earth was created for you to play in. Like, the earth is your sandbox. Like, we, we, we take such difficult, simple things, we make them so difficult. How many of you, okay, we didn't have iPads. I had a Sega Genesis, and that didn't work half the time. We used to play in sandboxes. All day, you come home, you have sand in places that only God knew. It was frustrating. 
But there was something about stepping into the sandbox that made you the king. Because even outside of the sandbox, you had no control. But inside of the sandbox, I own this. A lot of us are in this sandbox where we have all the control. God's given us dominion and power and order, and we're begging to get out. We're begging to get out of the environment that God put us in to make effective change. Okay, here we go. So ask your neighbor, where is your confidence? Is your confidence in what God showed you, the vision? And let's break that down even more. Can I do that? If I can do that, clap once. If I can do that, clap twice. (laughs) Vision isn't what you see. It's how you see. Vision is not what you see. It is how you see. You do, you, your vision is not what you see through these two balls in your head. That's sight. What vision is, is when God calls your heart to his, and he shows you something that you do not have the capacity, the resources, the time, or the power to finish. Because God, I, he, he's literally comical. God went to Noah and said, what? I want you to build me an ark. A What? I feel like God would talk to, like, these men in the Bible and women in the Bible and use words that they never heard of. Like, right. like we, just, we assume, like, build an ark. Oh, yeah, I'm going to build it this big. No, he's like, build an ark. They probably had to, like, pull out an encyclopedia and be like, ark. Well, <laughs> never heard of this word before. You know, we've only been down here for a minute, so hold on. <laughs> Anything that God wants to do through you is going to have to be impossible. So all the time that you try to take wrapping your head around, how am I going to get this done? God's like, stop and just make it happen. Moses didn't have time to present a business plan or to save or invest in a 4013B or anything like that to move the people of Israel out. And if he would have taken the time to plan, think about how many generations of people would have died because he didn't just go. Somebody say, just go. go. Say it like you mean it. Just go. go. Vision in front of you, it's it's, it's not like grounded on what you can do. If it was grounded on what you could do, we wouldn't need the cross. Watch this. I'm going back to the cake analogy. You ready? You are the cake. You are everything that God made, right? In Genesis 1, 26, he said, what? Let us make man in our our likeness. And there, like, I'm going to blow myself into him. So now he is not like God, but he is a God, lowercase g. Pastor Martin, clear that up. I'm just teaching it from how I experienced it. We are the cake, but God is the icing on top of it. Basically meaning that, man, God literally puts his super on top of our natural That's good for somebody. God takes who you are, the natural part of who you are, and he puts himself. We call that grace. We call that mercy. We call that benevolence. He puts that on top of you, and now you're finished. So what's the point of walking on earth if you never change anything? You're a cake without the icing. We good? Vision isn't how, is, vision is not what you see, it's how you see. In the Matrix, in the third movie, right, Neo loses his vision. And when you're watching it, you kind of feel bad for him. But what happens? You start to realize that the entire time, he only saw the world in code. So he was never, he, he, he was never, he was never worried about what he could physically see, but he always worried about what he could see on the inside of him. In the book of Eli, he's walking what? He's walking west with the word of God. And you're like, man, this dude is dope. He's sniping folks, kill him with a machete. And then what happens? He gets to the place he's supposed to be, and you figure out what? He was blind the entire movie. I want you to get something today. I know it's cute, and it's Sunday, so you're just here because you have to be. But there's like four people in here that I'm talking to. It's not about what you see. It's about what God showed you. God is wondering, do you have the faith to follow what I showed you? Because what is in front of you is not always going to be inspiring. The children of Israel, there's a land of milk and honey, but God, we're out in the desert. There's a land of milk and honey, but Lord, you just gave us manna, and it's nasty. There's a land of milk. Okay, you know what? I got to kill y'all. This is what my papa says. He says, I, only chew my, I never chew my cabbage twice. Say that. You know what that means? Once I chew, I swallow it. 
You know what that means in layman's terms? If I tell you once, that's it. If I have to come back to you again, I'm moving on. We are in a season where God is not playing about the vision he gave you. I'm not even in my notes. God got to the point where he killed, God killed, God killed the people that he loved because they would not take his word seriously. I'm sorry, mom, I know you're texting me, but I'm, I'm like, I can't give you scripture if we don't get past this. Do you honor the vision that God gave you? Or are you more crazily like scared of what is in front of you? Where is your confidence? Is it in what you see or is it in what God showed you? Because if it's in what God showed you, you can close your eyes and walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Matter of fact, in the valley of the shadow of death, set up a picnic, eat some teas and crumpet, and God's like, it's time to go. I'm like, God, I don't think I'm ready to leave yet. I don't think my haters have seen me shine enough yet. <laughs> I don't think those people that hated on me have seen me good enough yet. Like, can we just chill here for a second? Because I understand in my Bible where the dark place is, that's where I shine the most. So, like, let's just, like, make a camp right here in the darkness. Can, can we do that? God killed the people that, that he loved the most because they did not have confidence in what he showed them. They had confidence in what they saw. So I only got four points today. Say four points. I'm not a Husker fan, but they do this at the game in the fourth quarter. I mean, they won two, but they played nobody. But hey, you know. Oh, God, there go our numbers. 70 people just logged off of Facebook Live. Here we go. Scream it at me. Say, confidence in your past. Confidence in your past. Sometimes we have more faith and more confidence in what has happened to us than what God is going to do with us in the future. Sometimes we look at our past experiences and we have more trust in that because it's happened over and over and over and over again. That when God gives us a vision for something new, we can't even trust it because we've not already been programmed. You guys ever met somebody that destroys a relationship because it's getting too good? That concept doesn't even make any sense to me. Like, well, it got too good, so I broke it off before my, I was heartbroken. Like, what? I, when I was dating, when I was dating, when, when I was dating, I would talk to some girls, right, and you talk to them, and I was the opposite of what they assumed this would be. The way that I am is no different. Then I was just like five foot, 310 pounds, and like terrible. Then I met Laron. Is he here? And I lost 70. Then I met Jeremy, and I got all chiseled up. What's good, baby? Um, but I would talk to them, and it would get to this point where everything was cool. And then, like, there was, like, this self-sabotage. Like, I would meet with her, and she'd be like, oh, my God, uh, you're, be, you're, like, you're, you're too good of a guy. I was like, come out. I'm, I'm, too, I'm too good of a guy for you to be with. So now you break up with me because you think I'm too good, and you're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. I want to encourage somebody that there is no other shoe with God. God's been too good. I've heard people say this. God has been too good. Like, let, let me stop going to church and tithing because something, I, I feel something's happening. And then something happens because you stop doing what you were doing and then you blame God. But I, I just want to encourage you that your past does not pay dividends. So stop investing in it. Your, 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 your past... You, you, used to be, you used to be out here in these streets, loose, sleep with anybody, smoke anything. Like, that, that's in the past, so stop investing in it. Your confidence shouldn't be in who you were. It should be in who you are and who you will be. I'm talking to somebody this morning. I'm going to wait in this spot. I'm going to wait in this spot. So we go to Exodus, right? So now they, they have now been, let, let's fast forward. So Moses goes back. He does all of the, uh, the signs and the wonders, the frogs and the blackout and the boils and all that other stuff, right? And, and he brings the people of Israel where? Into the wilderness. But in Exodus 16, 1 through 3, this is what we find out. On the 15th day of the second month after they had left Egypt, the whole company of Israel moved on from Elam to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. The whole company of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron there in the wilderness. The Israelites said this, Why didn't God just let us die in the comfort of Egypt where we had lamb stew and all the bread we could eat? You brought us into the wilderness to starve us to death. 
the whole company of Israel. So God goes, okay, evidently what I showed you in vision is not good enough. So in Exodus 16, 4 through 5, he says, okay, let me just rain down some bread. There, there it is. They get the bread, and then what happens? They complain about what God gave them. Stop complaining when God gives you things in your season of turmoil. I don't deserve this relationship. Shut up. God sent this relationship on purpose. You've heard the story of the man in the boat, and the boat is sinking, and a man comes on a rowboat. Hey, let me help. Don't worry, my God will save me. A freight comes by. Mm-mm. Hey, bro. No, don't worry, dog. God's going to save me. A cruise liner comes by. Don't worry. God's... A chopper comes by. The man drowns. God thought you were going to save me. I did. I tried. I sent you a rowboat. I sent you a raft. I sent you an oil rig. I, s- I even sent you a chopper in the middle of nowhere. Sometimes we get so caught up in seeing, the, seeing God's hand that we don't even worry about what's in his hand. Like we worship, oh my God, God is blessing me. And God's like, yeah, I know I'm great, but take what's in my hand. You need this. Okay, moving on. Moving on. So here are a couple of points. Your past is what was once comforting. They talk about we were eating good in slavery. That doesn't even sound right. I mean, I know we was getting beaten. We was working 60-hour days. Not grammatically possible, but man, we was eating good. I got food, I got sleep, it was great. (laughs) That's terrible. It was the place of least stress. If I break your mind, I own you as a person. If you draw a circle around an ant, they they, they don't see up above it. They never bring their head up. They only look at what's there and they don't think that they can cross the threshold. That's why if you take an elephant and you put a pin in the ground and you, and you tie a thread to them, by the time that they're older, you don't even have to have the thread anymore. They'll just continue walking in a circle. Your past can train you to not see opportunity. Your past can make you believe that you're not worthy of God's grace and mercy. Where God is looking for you to do what? Put your confidence in what I showed you and not what you're experiencing. Is this good? Your past is also familiarity. It's the place of no resistance. It's basically saying it's good here. It's not broken, so I'm not going to fix it. But God is calling us to do what? Break every single rule possible and fill it back with the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Okay, here we go. Second point. We can put our confidence in things. Once God delivers them, right, He, he delivers them, they get to this place, They no longer trust Moses because they've lost sight of what God showed them in vision, right? Why they're doing what they're doing. Now now they're they're just worried about being out in the desert and we're going to die. So what happens? Moses goes up to a rock. He has an experience with God where he sees the burning bush, right? God explains to Moses, hey, this is where you're going. See that down there? See that place? He takes him up to the mountain because sometimes God's got to elevate you out of your stuff so you can tell you where you're going. A friend of mine wrote a book called The Season of Isolation. Sometimes we get frustrated because, like, where all my friends go? They broke up with me. Nobody wants to have lunch with me. And God's just like, no, if if you were with them, like, I wouldn't be able to speak to you. There are some things you don't share with everybody. Just because God gave you vision doesn't mean you have to share it with everybody. Well, they're my friends. Yeah, but... eh. What's for you is for you, and you share it with those people that you've done what? You have covenant with. Set the price on your life and keep it there. If the cost to be in your life is $25 and I come to you with $24.99, I can't be your friend. You should not let me be your friend. Stop discounting your life for people that only got a buck 25. (laughs) To be in my life, it's a whole C on. It's 100 bucks. Well, I got 99. Go get another dollar. Well, I, you're just being rude. You're just being stuck up. No, this is the price on my life. Why would I discount what I know is worth? Why would I discount my worth so that you can buy my product at, at, at a low bar? It took me $100. It took me a lot of time crying, sleeping, and crying out to God to get to this point. So how dare I sell it to you for a cheap rate of a process you never went through? Because you weren't with me when I was crying and trying to figure out who the heck I was. You weren't with me when I thought what I went through was going to take me out. So why would I sell you the perfect person who I am now at a cheap rate at the beginning? 
three payments of $19.99. No, I'm worth a million dollars, bro. Go save some. Young ladies, you are worth a million dollars. Stop settling for a dude that got 10 cents in his pocket. I can show you stuff. I can show you things. I'm worth a milli. Say it. I accept PayPal, Cash App, checks. I don't do cash because cash is dirty. You feel me? All right, here we go. I don't want no ones. I'm cool. Don't know where they've been. Anyway, confidence in things. Let's go there. Is that cool? Exodus 32, 1 through 2. Is this good for somebody this morning? I feel comfortable this morning, so we're good, right? Okay, cool. Exodus 32, 1 through 2. It says, when the people realized that Moses was taking forever in coming down off the mountain, they thought it was forever. But this is where we understand that better is one day in your than what? A thousand elsewhere. When you are in the presence of God and God is casting to you his vision, it's almost like time doesn't exist. This is where, like, your friends feel like you've fallen off the face of the earth, but you felt like, man, that was only like two days. Like, no, bro, we haven't seen you in two years. When you're focused on what God showed you, time doesn't even matter. And if me taking care of myself causes a problem for you, why are we friends? I need to go take care of myself. Oh, so you're just going to leave us out here? Like, what? That don't even make sense. I'm going to go take care of myself so I can be a better friend for you. And you're frustrated about the time it's going to take? Young men, when she tells you you're not ready yet or you ask to date her and she says no, it's not a no because she's not attracted. It's because she probably sees the man that God showed her and you're not him yet. So, 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 oh, this is, oh, this is dope. So basically what, what I'm trying to say is, is that I'm saying no to you right now, but you can be a totally different person in six months. I dated her and she said no. It's because you're not the man that God showed her. What did God show her? Because what she sees is not what she wants. Oh, my goodness. Okay, here we go. So he goes up to the mountain, he comes back down, and they basically look at Aaron, because Aaron was the second in command, right? Have you ever been in a place where you're the second in command, and like the people are like, what do we do? And you're like, uh, one second, when are you coming back? That's what Aaron's like, Moses, (laughs) where you at, dog? These people going crazy, uh, I need some help. So basically, in in the second verse, he goes, do something, make gods for us, who will lead us? That Moses, that man who God said was supposed to be the one to get us out of Egypt, who knows what's happened to him? Exodus 32, 2 through 3, they basically do what? They make gods. They get so scared of the environment that's around them and their leader's not there anymore that they have to make something to worship. Some of it's it's your family. The word of God says to honor your family, not to coddle your family. Because your family can be the reason that you miss out on great opportunity. Some people make a statue out of money. I'm trying to get all the bread that I can. I'm trying to be the baker's man. You feel me? Wow, that rhymed. Sign me, whoever's watching. Sign me. I'm trying to be the baker's man. I'm trying to get this bread. And you worship the dollar. You get get stuck in this rat race of trying to get a dollar. And because the dollar is what governs your life, more things happen that cost you more money. Because the more you become affluent in money, the more your appetite increases. So a pair of shoes that pay less now is a pair of Yeezys for $700 resale. Lord, have mercy. God, save me, Lord, Father. Oh, I felt that one. Oh, that hurt. (laughs) I love shoes. Gotta love them. Anybody love shoes, say amen. Thank you, Father. Right? So we start to make an idol of something. I know it's funny, but we start to make an idol of something that was supposed to be something that we have control over, and now it controls us. So they take the gold that they took from Egypt, they melt it down and make a calf out of it. Sometimes you can take what God gave you as provision and start worshiping it. Oh, yeah, doc, we're going there. I'm going to come down here and sit in your lap. God gives you a job, and now you don't need God because you got the job. So you don't show up here, and this is the only place that you have real connection to. You lose that funky little job, and then you want to get upset with God. And God's like, no, it wasn't a job in the first place. You've worshipped the thing that I gave you rather than from the source it came from. You want another one? You make your relationships your God. You build confidence in people, and you find... 
Sometimes we find people that have the same issues as us by fixing the issue in them that miraculously our issue is taken care of. My pop says, if you're the smartest person, if you're the go- most gorgeous person, if you're the most affluent person in your group, you got to get out. And you don't apologize for environments that you leave. When aliens came in movies and they blew up Earth, they never said sorry. <laughs> they came, took everything, blew up, and said, all right, where's the next planet? That's how regal you got to be. I'm coming into this thing to blow it up, burn it down, and keep it pushing. Like, I came to shut it down, and I'm not sorry about it. When you, walk into your, when you walk into your sphere of influence, I'm coming to shut this game down. When you walk into the hospital, nothing moves in this building without my okay. Even if you don't physically sign a piece of paper, when you walk in that thing, I, I decree that babies are going to be healed today. Cancer, I mean, you know what I'm talking about? Okay, let's, let's, let's bring it home. If you're an educator, when I walk into the school, every student in this school has the capacity to learn. Why? Because I'm here. When you go to the family reunion and you can't stand your mama-in-law, I can't stand her. God, I wish you get hit by a bus. No. When you walk in, everything in this family works because I'm here. And I'm not conceited for thinking that way. Somebody stand up and say, I got the power. Come on, one time. Come on, scream it. Say, I got the power. When I walk into the room, it has to change. And if it doesn't change, something is not right. Stop walking into situations and being comfortable with how it is. That's not what you were. God did not die on a cross for you to sing, oh, bleed me to the. That's stupid. God died on the cross so that the blood that's running through his son can run through you. Say it again. I got the power. Say it like, like if you screamed it loud enough that you would explode. Say it again. Say, I got the power. All right, sit down. I got it. Thank you, Father God. Third point. Say third point. Clap three times. Cha-cha, real smooth. All right, here you go. So God's done what? He's delivered them from Egypt. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. This is how I got it. Took me six, literally... I'll tell the story later. It took me six weeks where I was like, God, where are you? And every day I was being fed. And I stopped looking up for him and I started looking in his word to find him. If you've ever lost a parent, thank you, Lord. This is Holy Spirit all day. This is Revelation. If you've ever lost a parent or a loved one, stop looking up to heaven and start looking at what they showed you and find them in the lessons they taught you while they were here. Jesus said what to the disciples before he died? I'm sorry I'm on a tangent, but this is good. He said what to the disciples? He said, yo, I'm fixing to leave, (laughs) right? I'm about to die. They start crying. He's like, y'all knew what it was when I started. Stop being in relationship with people that try to defer you from what God showed you in the beginning. I want to be bigger than Jay-Z. Are you sure? Cut off. I don't even want to hear the rest of the sentence. I'm going to be bigger, bigger than Steven Spielberg. Are you? Cut you off. Jesus says, I'm finna die. Say, finna die. die. Welcome to Mississippi, everybody. I'm I'm fixing to die. But I'm going to send you a helper, though. A a helper, though. He's called the Holy Spirit. So instead of looking into the clouds for Jesus, where are you? Look in my word and find me in there. This is why, as parents, it's more important for you to teach your children something than to be worshipped as I'm the parent. Who cares? Any, people, any two people can lay down and make a baby. That's great. But do you father and do you mother the child? Parenting is not proved while you're here. It's proved when you're gone or you're not there. So the fact that you're parenting your children and you're here is irrelevant. How are they when you're not around? Oh, it's like playing in daddy's clothes, but daddy's coming home at some point in time. Sorry, let me fix your lap. I was sitting. My bad. Here we go. Number three, confidence in what you see. Confidence in what you see. Numbers 13, 1 through 2, God spoke to Moses. Once he finally comes down, he destroys everything that they built. Like he walks up and he's like, man, what? 
this is the goal that God told us. That's my bezel chain, bro. Like, that's my bust down. Like, you, bust down means you put diamonds on a watch. Sorry. Rap music. Ratchet culture. Sorry. Um, like, you, you've taken all of the spoils that God told us to take from Egypt, and you've made goats and cows, and now you're worshiping them. So he gets to the point where he's like, okay, let, let me, God, show me something. And God basically tells him in Numbers, he says, send scouts out to the country of Canaan that I'm giving to the people of Israel. So God says, okay, I've given you food. I've delivered you from slavery. That should have been enough. Given you food, gave you a great leader, but now you still don't believe it. So let, let, let's just go send some people to go and see it. Numbers 13, 27 through 19, we went to the land to which you sent us. They come back. And, oh, it does flow with milk and honey. Just look at this fruit. They brought some with them. But then, while they're accounting for what happened, there, there's, there's a part where they say, but worse yet, we saw descendants of giants in the land that God gave us. So let's go back to that question. Where is your confidence? Is it in what God showed you? Or is it in what you saw in the place that God showed you? God said, I'm going to give you a land of milk and honey. He didn't tell you who was going to be there inhabiting it before you got there. God told David, I'm going to give you the kingdom and, right, and the, and the daughter of the king, all the money you want, all that stuff. But he didn't necessarily tell them that when he went to go take his brothers, those two legs and a biscuit, he took them some food, right? I'm just trying to make it modern so y'all click with this because y'all going to be at drive by Popeye's and be like, <laughs> church Sunday, yeah, and go to work. Um, so he, t- he goes to take them two legs and a biscuit, spicy, extra crispy, and you got to have water because if you eat a Popeye's biscuit with no water, that's suicide. <laughs> what? Um, you feel me? What? You ever ate a biscuit with no water, bro? <clears throat> Bad. Come back, come back, come back, come back. God showed him the spoils before he showed him Goliath. God showed Jesus everybody in his kingdom and his glory with power before he showed him the cross. But we worship the cross. David killed Goliath. David, like, Goliath is dead, but we were, like, he was so amazing. We forget about the fact that he reigned for, like, 60 to 70 years in peace. Could you imagine being in a country where it was run in peace? Total peace. Where if you take a snapshot of our room in our church and we take it to other churches, this would scare them, that we have white people sitting next to people that don't speak English, speaking to other people that are tr- tr- like dealing with being gay and homosexual, but like they still love God, and we're just like, hey, we know that what you're dealing with is smaller than the God that we serve. People would freak out just by being here. This room, I'm coming back, icing cake. The vision of this house is that this is what the world looks like. I'm getting there. But y'all don't have confidence in what I showed you. You have confidence in where I'm at right now, so I have to show you where I'm going. Anybody get that? Okay. The vision of Ambassador's Worship Center is, is that what is here is what's supposed to be out there. That I'm a kingdom citizen that loves God, that six foot finally, thank you, Lord, 245, 245 pounds, 50 pounds on a good day, and I just so happen to be black. But the first important part is that I love God and I love people. But who I am is, it's a part of my identity, but it's not who I am. And what the world wants right now, what government wants right now, these powers that be, is they want to use what you see to put your confidence in. That's how you can say one nation under God, indivisible, but then when you see somebody kill somebody of different race, now that's the, that's the verdict. So standing or sitting for the Pledge of Allegiance means absolutely nothing. If when I see somebody that looks different like me, I have to see them as the same person. How can I say I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and then shoot my brother? Black, white, green, chicken chicken noodle soup, you are my brother. The fact that I eat my cornbread with greens and you eat your cornbread with butter and honey, that's disgusting, but we're still brothers. The fact that my macaroni has never came from a box. Hey, yeah. Yeah. Hey. Sorry. Oh, God. Thanksgiving's coming, y'all. Hey, God. Glory. Anyway, just because my macaroni and cheese comes out of an oven with six different cheeses, and yours comes out of a box and it's on a crock pot, hey, it's mac. Not so much, but it's macaroni. And we're still brothers regardless of how you eat. 
Ambassadors Worship Center is a nation undivisible with God as the up above, right? And we rule with four things. You know what they are? Love, hope, dominion. Dude, I'm too clean with this, bro. Oh, my God. I think, like, when Michael Jordan was playing, he was probably like, dude, this is just, like, too easy. Like, get somebody else out here. Like, like you get so good at what you do that you just do it in your sleep. But you're too worried about what you see than what God showed you in you. If God showed you that you're supposed to have an organization that works with beaten and battered women, where you piece women back together after they've been destroyed, follow that. Don't worry on your own brokenness, because the brokenness that you're going through is the wilderness God has to take you through. God's like, stop worrying that he cheated on you. Stop worrying that you were raped. Stop worrying about that. It's terrible, but it had to happen so that when I take you out of the wilderness, you can go back to Egypt. And when she's crying, like, baby girl, I've been there before. Let me show you how to get this money. That happened to me too. I thought he loved me too, but guess what? You don't need him. And guess what? On the other side, once you figure yourself out, there's a man that God made for you. Amen. Is that good? Find yourself in what you do and what God showed you, not in what you see. Because what you see will always change. That's why God said to love your brother, period. Not love your brother when you, or not love your brother, your husband, your wife, your sister, when you really feel like it, because you ain't always going to feel like it. Just love them, period. Because if I love you with no reason, no matter how you treat me, I'm still going to love you. Here we go. Let me get back to the points. Confidence in what you see, right? So they get, they get out, they send the spies to go and look, and they see people in their land. Confidence in what you see. Sometimes you're sent to a place inhabited by others. Because God understands a couple of things. If you don't kill it, you can't claim it. Write that down. So what you see in front of you is scary as heck, and you're scared of it, and this thing's going to eat me. But God's like, I, I, can't, I, can, I can kill this for you, but then you're always going to say, oh, God delivered us from this. But God's like, I put something in you so that you can kill it. So in order for you to claim what it is, you have to kill it. That's why God sends you into territories that are already inhabited by people. That's why he sends you to a job with a, with a, with a, with a boss that you hate. That's why he had you marry somebody with a family that you can't stand. Because your job is to kill whatever is there and put something else in place that can give them life. God, I got like three more points. And I got three minutes. Hey, mom, if you're watching, text me if I can get more time. All right. Dad, too, but mom's like, <laughs> opposition is a sign that you are going in the right direction. If you run into a, if you run, mm, I think God is going to call the people of God that once we start running into brick walls, we start praising at the wall. Like, you're going to start walking, everything's working, you're going to hit a brick wall, and you're going to be like, oh, shoot. <laughs> yeah, there's a wall here, and people going to be like, what's wrong with you? No, 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 no. I've broken down some walls, and there's always something on the other side. So, like, what's the wall made out of? The last wall was made out of paper. This one's made out of stone. Oh, snap. <laughs> what's behind the wall? God, thank you for the wall. Come on, stand up. Thank you for the wall, God. Thank you for the wall. Thank you, Lord. Oh, 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 oh my God. Thank you for the wall. So we get so frustrated because we see opposition and we run away. This is so, this is how I got it. This is how I got it. The last wall was made out of stone. This one has a touch keypad. Like you got to put your hand on it. Yo. What's on, what's on the opposite side? You take your seats. In video games, you meet like this boss that's like 10 times your power level. I'm like, I'm about to get so much loot, bruh. I'm about to get a new sword and like a, and anyway. I'm a geek. Anyway, so let's move on. This is the fourth and final point. <laughs> Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Number four, confidence in your abilities. Once everything fails, sometimes we put confidence in what we believe we can do. Can I, um, can you bring those blocks out and can you set them on the floor? Caleb, can you help him, please? I'm going to show you something. We put confidence in our abilities. Numbers 22 through 5. There was no water there for the community, so they ganged up on Moses and Aaron. And they said, we wish that we would have died. They brought up the same stuff. Down here, please. 
Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, down here, down here, down in the middle, please. Um, We wish we died with the rest of our brothers and sisters. So what happens is that Moses goes up to another rock, a high place. And uh, God tells him, he says, okay, they want water. He gives them specific instruction. Anybody know what he says? He says, okay, there's a rock in the middle of the people. What I want you to do is I want you to speak to the rock and water's going to flow. Very specific. God is very specific. God just says, turn left on Saddle Creek, not, not right. You don't know who you're going to run into. Right? <laughs> Speak to the rock. What does Moses do? Moses becomes so frustrated with the people that he forgets what God told him, and he works off of what he sees. So he takes his staff, and he hits the rock. The water comes out. Still, God, like even if you don't follow God's instruction, God's will will still be done. God wanted Moses to speak to the rock so that people would see God in his action. But sometimes we trust our own abilities and we put confidence in the me, me, I, 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 and God can't bless the me, me, I, I, I. Can you guys make it a little bit longer? This way? Like four across and then build it up. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be good. Moses strikes the rock. God tells him to come back up to the mountain. Numbers 20 and 12. God, I, I think God just got so frustrated with Moses. Like this whole time... I've delivered you from slavery. I've delivered you from not being killed, and, and this is how you treat it. Okay, Moses, he asked him to do what? Come back up to the mountain. I got to talk to you. Remember that land of milk and honey that I promised you before I promised the people? Read your, read your word. Read your word. Read your word. Numbers twenty twelve. God said to Moses and Aaron, because you didn't trust me and you didn't treat me with the holy reverence in front of the people of Israel. It's not always about what you do. It's how you do it. My brother Kylan says that all the time. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. The word of God says that it's not because you hit the rock, it's because your heart was not in the right place. You two aren't going to lead this company into the land that I am giving them. So the same mountain that God gave Moses the vision that he was going to see this place is the same mountain that he says, this is as far as you're going to go. You put your confidence in your own abilities, and it, 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 it'll, it'll never work. Can I do something for you? You sure? It's going to be an enactment, but I, I, I need, is there any, any people in the room, husband and wife, that you're looking for some breakthrough in your life? Husband and wife need some breakthrough. I need, I need one family to stand up. Okay, just because they're here, watch this. Okay, guys, this is, this is fine. It's good. Mom, I use the blocks, like the puzzle pieces. They're, they're here. She can see me. Anyway, okay, that's good, guys. Okay, Ms. Walker, I want you to stand here. I have more notes, but this is going to be it. This is your altar call. I want you to stand over here. There is something that God has shown you, the vision. That, that's what you are when you guys get married. This is going to bless your soul I'm, I, because it, it, it hit me. This is the vision that God showed you. But this is what you see. Try to get to her. Do you see me or do you see what God showed you? Try to get to her again. Listen up. It's not funny because this is where people are right now. Somebody in this room is dealing with this right now. Do you trust what I showed you and the children that are going to come out of this thing? That thing, the womb that you don't have as a man? Or are you going to deal with what's in your face pushing you back? The word of God that I read says greater is he that is on the inside of me. So it doesn't matter how much I push, push back. You ain't supposed to let me, you ain't supposed to let this put, you ain't supposed to let this push you. One second. 
Is what you see stronger than what God showed you? Can we take it another step further? Y'all trust me? You sure? You're not going to push me over. I squat you. Okay. Come here. Watch this. I need you to get down. Watch this. Is there a camera here? Sometimes God puts something in front of you that you think is going to take you out. But what God showed you is bigger than what you're dealing with. So if you keep your eyes on her and not on me, you'll get to her every time. God says if, 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 if you can keep your eyes on what I showed you in the beginning, no matter what comes in between you, you won't have to worry about it. The word of God says that we don't, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. We don't wrestle. We don't listen. We don't wrestle with what's in front of us, with what you can touch. But what you're wrestling with is yourself embodied in the struggle that you're going through. So fight me. Fight me. Get to her. Come on. Get to her. God is looking for you to fight for what he showed you. Music. God wants you to fight for what he showed you. And stop looking at what's in front of you. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's message. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. If you are interested in not missing any other videos that we upload, make sure to click the subscribe button down below. Also, if this message has impacted you in such a way, you can also click the link down below to donate and to give to our ministries here at Ambassadors Worship Center. Anyway, thank you so much and we'll see you next week.